Perry knew why the simple islanders didn't want him to come ashore. An English ship had received the traditional native hospitality only 30 years earlier, but since then the Satsuma lords ordered Shuri to keep foreigners out. The Commodore had written the Secretary of the Navy that Okinawans, disarmed as they long have been, have no means, even if they had the inclination, to rebel against the grinding oppression of their rulers. But instead of showing compassion for the semi-captives, he punished them more. Solely concerned with American national interests, in his own expansionist view of them, the high-handed intruder puffed with his own virtuousness and even convinced himself the Okinawans much appreciated him for it. That set the pattern of American-Okinawan relations. Severely one-sided exchanges that would take place on the latter's land, at their expense. The island's poverty only tightened the cycle of the powerful and self-righteous extracting concessions from the poor and weak. Perry rested his actions on the strictest rules of moral law, America's goodness and wisdom making the justice of his demands self-evident. Japan's worse aggrandizement grew out of greed for Okinawa's trade and her sense of herself as supreme, without the Christian self-assurance, but with other myths of similar effect. The two powers that held themselves morally superior in their respective ways blithely violated a modest people who made no such claim. At one point before Satsuma's conquest, a Shimazu lord offered to settle a debt with ownership of the Ryukyus, to which he had no claim whatever. No less imperiously, Perry proposed annexing Okinawa as a base for military operations against Japan if his mission there failed. Such were the attitudes of rapacious earlier centuries, as if the 20th would be easier on the Okinawans. Now, 92 years after the Commodore had had his way with the defenceless island, the modern Mississippi took aim on the same Shuri Castle, making ready to demolish the 16th century monument and centre of national life. Little was left of the surrounding area. Okinawa had been taking heavier naval bombardment for a longer period than any other battle site in history. Even in the north, buildings were levelled that might have served military purposes, although many didn't. But the island's southern third fared far worse. Except during bad weather, most places even hinting of defensive value, there had been under fire from sea and air for almost 60 days. Shuri Heights had been a prime target from the first. An expert would calculate that 200,000 rounds of artillery alone were fired into the little city of about 5,000 houses. Naval shells and hundreds of thousand-pound bombs completed what a native called the laughter of metal shrieking through the air. But the walls of Shuri Castle, built of coral block by 10,000 people three centuries earlier, had withstood the pounding. It was those ramparts, 20 feet thick at their base and towering to more than 40 feet, on which Mississippi trained her 14-inch guns on May 25th. American infantrymen with time to look could see naval shells cooling from white to red as they arced toward the target. Soon Colorado joined with her 16 inches. Cracks began to appear after a second day of almost continuous salvos from both wagons, which moved closer for a third day of work. By the evening of May 27th, the huge walls had crumbled and the epicentre of five centuries of Okinawan culture was rubble. Extolling its loveliness shortly before the war, a Japanese artist called the castle area of about 300 acres, the size of a large college campus, the most beautiful in Japan. Other castles were grander and other beauty spots more impressive, another Japanese admirer explained in 1938. But Shuri Castle's sight, structure and views of the sea and gentle undulating hills formed a unique ensemble. How can we find in Japan such a perfect combination of nature and culture? Now all was gone. Only stone fragments remained of the fairy tale little roads that had wound to gardens and ponds. Magnificent ancient trees were stumps, some still smoking. Around them, the city too was cinders, dust, and the stench of rotting flesh. Quaint paper and wood dwellings with stone walls and pretty little terraces had been blown to bits or burned to the ground, hardly leaving an ash. Japanese soldiers who'd occupied the grounds of the old royal residences a week after L-Day drove away, 
Okinawan custodians who were trying to bury or otherwise protect priceless treasures. From magnificent gifts of Chinese emperors to ceremonial artifacts of the Okinawan dynasty. By late May, the loss was virtually total. Only a buried chronicle of the Okinawan people from the 15th to 16th centuries was almost certainly still there, but Okinawans would find it gone when they would be permitted to return to the old capital. The 22 volumes were snatched as souvenirs and smuggled to America. When they were at last located, it took almost 10 years of pressure and pleading to convince a naval commander to return them. Naha's devastation was also complete, although the Americans needed a few more days to mop up Japanese snipers and mortar platoons concealed in the capital's ruins. On May 23rd, five days after the securing of Sugarloaf, Marine troops crossed the Asato River, now swollen and muddy from the relentless rains, and fought their way into the city's northern outskirts. The stench of rotting bodies was so strong that the pilot of an observation plane had to cover his face with his hands, even several hundred feet in the air, and with a fresh sea breeze blowing. Another pilot saw a wall standing, not a single entire building, but just that one white wall, rising uselessly from the ruins. No more concerned with civilians than the average American, he nevertheless also noticed that all the neighbouring villages had been destroyed and the people who lived in them killed or driven into camps. From the ground, a marine infantryman saw the former city of 65,000, almost 15% of Okinawa's population, as debris. Naha was a deserted, bomb-levelled pile of rubble without even a passable street. The contrast with Guadalcanal and other primitive or deserted islands Dick Whitaker had seen in the Pacific may have made his imagination richer. In early June, when his company pushed through the largest city ever taken by Marines and the first Japanese city taken by any Americans, fragments of theatres and other buildings suggested to him that it may once have been a fine liberty town but other marines saw only a blackened, smouldering wasteland where practically not one stone remained on any other stone except for in an occasional piece of a building's façade. Perhaps just because too little of the capital remained to suggest what had been lost, it prompted little American sorrow. Native sorrow also tended to go elsewhere. Although the Japanese had changed the capital to Naha soon after annexing the island, Okinawans still loved Shuri. For all Naha's commercial importance, it never replaced the seat of their ancient dynasty as the cultural heart and soul. Now nothing remained there either. The palace was gone, the temples, the great gates, and the ancient gardens of the Shuri gentry, an American historian with long residence on Okinawa would summarise. Gone, too, were the ancient artefacts reposed in these places, together with the monuments, manuscripts and historical records. The obliteration of so much of a distinct culture was an incalculable misfortune. Weary, wary units of both the Army and the Marine Corps entered Shuri two days later. Droves of Japanese and Okinawan corpses and rotting trunks of Army horses lay beside heaps of rubble. The hardiest architectural survivors were the bell tower and concrete walls of a small Methodist church built four years before Pearl Harbor, together with the concrete shell of the two-story normal school where Masahide Ota, still delivering 32nd Army messages, had studied. Just two groups of unwanted foreigners had previously forced their way into Shuri during its long history as the capital, the ruthlessly expansionist Satsuma Japanese, who invaded in 1609 to end the island's independence and Matthew Perry's landing party in 1853. With good intentions and bad, out of callous greed and perhaps unavoidable necessity, brave warriors of the same two nations had now managed to utterly demolish the centre. London's blitz, Berlin's blasting and even Leningrad's blockade caused less proportionate damage to their respective countries' national wealth and heritage than the loss of almost all the symbols of Okinawa's independent past. More than the desolation, what interested 10th Army staffs was the relatively moderate opposition encountered during the final push into the city. 
They didn't know it came not from the Japanese 32nd Army making its last stand near the headquarters tunnel, but from skeleton rearguard units assigned to delay and deceive. For Ushijima had evacuated the bulk of his depleted forces. Announcement of his intention to do so was why he called his May 22nd conference after planning the surprise move since May 18th when Sugarloaf finally fell. Some of his divisional commanders disapproved. Although the South teemed with caves, few had been converted to strong points. Besides, it seemed right to fight to the end in the main fortifications where so much blood had been lost. But Colonel Hiromichi Yahara, the chief operations officer, again criticised their desire to die an honourable death at Shuri as useless sentimentality, and Ushijima overruled all objections. That made Shuri's capture, so long a major goal, less significant than the Americans had expected. It signalled the end of the hardest fighting, but not the greatest killing. Militarily, the evacuation was a great success. 32nd Army Headquarters was reinstalled in an excellent, if far less elaborate, position in the far south, just a few miles below the beach where the 2nd Marine Division had fainted a landing on El Day, and critics of General Buckner's frontal tactics proposed a real second landing to outflank the Shuri line. The staff quickly resumed operations from there, but once again, the benefit to Japan, this one even more temporary, was at Okinawa's expense. During the rest of the campaign, and for decades afterward, civilians would pay the heaviest price for Ushijima's skill. Had 10th Army commanders known of the withdrawal, they probably could have shortened the campaign by weeks, bombing, shelling and outflanking it into a rout. But the 11th hour operation was superbly accomplished because the Japanese had good luck on top of their astonishing ability to persevere, despite the hardship of loading and marching all night on empty stomachs. The rearguard force fought cleverly and skillfully enough to allay American suspicions for several crucial days, the same days whose bad weather helped prevent reconnaissance and intelligence from making sense of the isolated movements of men and equipment that were spied on the roads leading south from Shuri. The pullout began almost immediately after the May 22nd conference, when the rain was still so heavy and ground-level fog so thick that the aeronautical ceiling remained effectively at zero. Concealed last-minute withdrawal was nothing new for Ushijima. He'd used it all along, at Kakazu Ridge on April 24th, for example, where he'd fired artillery barrages and taken advantage of a foggy night to fall back from the fortifications there just before his troops were encircled. If American staffs had learned the lesson of their surprise when they finally took Kakazu, they forgot it by now, a month later. And although southern moving Japanese columns spied during a partial clearing on May 26th were bombed and strafed, other columns were reported moving north. American intelligence therefore assumed that Ushijima, far from withdrawing, was replacing his wounded and most exhausted troops with fresh reserves from the south. More confusing was that some of the columns appeared to consist of civilians dressed in white. Many were actually disguised Japanese soldiers. That prompted anguish even among some of the most pro-Japanese Okinawans, who foresaw that Americans, after uncovering the subterfuge, would take less care not to shoot civilians. It made sense to the Americans, further misleading them about the clever withdrawal, that civilians were evacuating south from Shuri. Their planes had dropped a deluge of leaflets urging just that, and also the wearing of white for protection from shooting. Those circumstances were largely responsible for misinterpreting the movements on the roads until the rains returned with a vengeance on May 29, 30 and 31, reducing visibility to near zero just when the last major unit of Captain Kojo's 24th Division pulled out. Thus, the massive withdrawal was accomplished with far better order than the Japanese could have expected in their dismal circumstances. Excellent planning under Yahara and stoic execution had extricated the 32 and army to fight not just another day but almost another gory month. When the skis cleared and intenser air reconnaissance resumed, 10th Army staff members were amazed that so much of the garrison had managed to pull out. Still, Americans knew they were over the worst, and many resumed their overconfidence. 
Even at that stage, they underestimated the Japanese ability to endure hell in order to die gloriously, killing the enemy. As for the civilian population, it was neither side's business, or only peripherally their business. Both had all they could do to fight their unprecedentedly demanding war. 21. South from the Shuri Line When Tadashi Kojo left the Shuri Line critical days after the general withdrawal, his mental and physical condition reflected the 32nd Armies as a whole. After crawling to regimental headquarters from the observation post where he'd attempted suicide, the captain was in no shape to exercise command even if his battalion had still existed. He spent the next 12 days about half a mile from doomed Shuri Castle, his first relief from the exhausting fighting that had begun for him on April 26th. Three weeks of continuous tension with almost no food. Now he rested in the protection of a well-built bunker that served as a signal centre, on the rear slope of Shuri Heights. He did not wonder why he no longer wanted to take his own life, only told himself that he must die in action. With no replacements, resupply or possible relief from the American onslaught, that would surely be soon. His command consisted of 1st Battalion's dozen survivors. While he rested, Colonel Yoshida, the regimental commander, scratched together a few men who'd been left behind around the regimental tunnel near Naha Airfield. More replacements arrived from airfield maintenance crews and other service troops pulled largely from hospitals. Some recovered only enough to limp and hobble. Soon the once highly trained and spirited battalion of over a thousand men had a ragtag collection of some forty souls armed with one light machine gun and several knee mortars. Their morale matched their combat readiness. It further sagged when Yoshida passed on Ushijima's order for the general withdrawal, which dealt a greater psychological blow than any delivered directly by the enemy. For all the pain of defending the Shuri line, the cost to Americans had heartened the battalion. Holding the fortifications had been seen as a kind of victory, now replaced with the anxiety and despair prompted by resort to futile improvisation. As long as the high command was in its hold-at-all-costs bunkers on Okinawa's high ground, the fighters had retained enough mental strength and unit cohesion to cope with their staggering losses. Abandoning them was the straw that finally destroyed their faith in eventual, in this case miraculous, victory, a central pillar of morale in every army. The strain on Kojo's survivors drastically increased when the confidence that had held them together collapsed, leaving them without hope for any further fighting. Americans are chasing us, encouraged and totally motivated. This is not the way to run a war, one said of the forthcoming retreat to hastily prepared or wholly unprepared positions. The rest of the 24th Division pulled out. Men who'd learned their night driving in Manchuria were at the wheels of its last operable trucks, transporting its remaining equipment and ammunition. But the 22nd Regiment remained at Shuri as a rear guard for the withdrawal. The job fell to Kojo, since all that was left of the regiment was all that was left of his 1st Battalion. On June 6th, they too left, first heading for the Little Noha River, some five miles south of Shuri. Some wounded were still too feeble to pick up the weapons of comrades killed beside them on the march. Kojo's rest had been much too short for recovery from his hunger and exhaustion on top of the wounds from the accidental December explosion. His own weakness depressed him as much as that of his force. He'd clung to hope against hope while taking the satisfaction of fulfilling his duty. Although part of him knew everything on expendable Okinawa was intended merely to delay the enemy's invasion of the mainland, from whose defence no precious resources or equipment could be diverted, another part fantasized that Okinawa was part of the final, inviolable circle that would be defended with everything available. With that fantasy now evaporated, the fight went out of him. He could do little more than stumble onto the dismal end, trying to mask his pessimism with a Japanese officer's prescribed serenity. He silently agreed that it was a mistake to leave Shuri, where at least some supplies of food and ammunition remained. A sister regiment in the 24th Division had been sent south weeks before to prepare positions and lay in supplies, but surely murderous chaos awaited the units that hadn't done that.
Everything Kojo had previously accomplished in the army had been grounded in preparation and procedures. Now the officers didn't know the terrain where they were headed, even if there were time to dig. They'd be targets, not fighters. His new adjutant reflected the change of mood. First Lieutenant Yatsugi, an artillery officer, had come up from long years in the ranks. After his unit was destroyed near Shuri, he was assigned to Kojo shortly before the 1st Battalion took up its position at Kochi. There he buoyed up himself and others with infectious reassurances of triumph when the combined fleet would arrive. When's it coming? Today? He'd ask with a smile during the worst bombardments. Now the cheery chatter was gone. Yatsugi and most of the men held their tongues in Kojo's presence, but they were deeply discouraged, especially, as Private Yoshio Kobayashi put it, because they had no idea where they were going or what would happen when we got to the unknown destination. The enfeebled soldiers were ordered to carry as many weapons and as much equipment as possible. They could not also carry the wounded, whose number seemed endless. The chief medical officer's rucksack served to transport the battalion's entire medical supplies, chiefly some bandaging. One man with both legs smashed crawled on all fours, his knees wrapped in rags. Few had any more strength or inclination than Kojo to notice hordes of even worse-off civilians who were trying to evacuate, grandmothers tugging at children of three and four who had seemingly forgotten how to cry, a baby screaming on the back of a mother dead long enough to begin to disintegrate, once the men had guarded their rifles with their lives. Any little scratch on them? Kobayashi remembered, would have got us sent to the stockade. Now the rusty things trailed in the mud. Only the young bearer of the treasured regimental colours retained something of the old spirit, never faltering no matter how close enemy bullets and bombs approached. Still, slivers of good luck were enough to dispel the exhaustion and demoralisation. When the rain miraculously let up, the group enjoyed the incredible additional luxury of no rain of American bombs and shells, which had broken off for an unknown reason. The sky actually turned blue, and the mood picked up enough for jokes, until the bombardment resumed hours later. A detachment from that group enjoyed another moment of relief when they were sent on to the temporary 1st Battalion headquarters and found it after midnight, dodging shells as they dragged themselves through the mud. The new cave, a former emplacement for destroyed 150mm cannon, was large and sturdy enough to provide a sense of security, despite the paucity of ammunition and almost total lack of food. Its protection was much needed during an intense enemy assault on the position the following morning. Toward its end, one of Kojo's burned-out men saw an artillery shell blow American bodies into the air and wanted to dance at the sight. His joy was brief. The Japanese guns resumed their silence and the enemy approached again in a blaze of automatic fire. Bullets hit fellows' heads. Kobayashi loaded his muddy, rusted rifle, aimed at one of the Americans closing in to kill him, and pulled the trigger. To his despair, he heard a click. Throwing away his soul of a soldier, he desperately gathered pebbles, rocks and rags for ammunition. The soldier in front of him screamed, I'm hit! and tumbled. Kobayashi accepted that his turn would be next, but dusk fell and the Americans broke off to make their night preparations. After dark, Kojo radioed an order to cease radio communications because he believed the enemy was locating the waves to pinpoint their shelling. He also ordered his communications section to evacuate its cave, a seemingly suicidal task, with the Americans encamped just outside but a new miracle brought salvation for Kobayashi and the others. They found a rear exit from the cave that opened onto a rocky slope. The wounded stifled all sounds from their fearful pain as they were dragged down the jagged incline. With no idea of where they were and only the outline of flare-lit hills to guide them, the communications unit wandered about in desperation, but finally found its way to Makabe, about a mile short of Okinawa's southern tip. The battalion's next destination was the same crossroads town of Makabe, on which many units were converging in confusion. It was only four miles south of Shuri, 
but Kojo, unable to walk unaided, couldn't reach it in one night. After dusk on June 8th, two of his men gripped him under his arms and the party set out. The night was dark, the downpour relentless. Except for the private who'd survived with him at Kochi, his men were all new. Hardly knowing them, he felt himself only their nominal commander. His only support was his duty to behave like an officer, an expression of pride to which he clung as his men half dragged him through the mud to a rest stop. Too weak to take in others' condition on the roads, he did recognise a new low of anguished desperation at the stop, a field hospital halfway to Makabe. That outpost of mutilated bodies and corpses was disbanding in the face of the enemy advance. Two rice balls, potassium cyanide and hand grenades were being distributed to those unable to evacuate. Ashen nurses told Kojo that the most severely wounded had already been injected. A voice cried out as he took in the appalling scene. Mr. Instructor, sir, please, Mr. Instructor. Japanese recruits undergoing their difficult adjustment to army life remembered their training officers no less than American Marines remembered their drill instructors. Despite his strictness, 2nd Lieutenant Kojo had been a popular regimental training officer in 1940, when he first joined the 22nd Regiment in Manchuria. But the tremulous voice would surely have pleaded to anyone its owner recognised. Kojo made out a former trainee one of whose legs had just been amputated near the hip. The weeping soldier said he knew what was in store for him because the hospital was disbanding. Even if he knew how to crawl with one leg, he could get nowhere through the deluge of rain and sea of mud. Like many of the grotesquely wounded, he had no idea of his unit's location, and he knew that many despairing Japanese soldiers from other units would give no help to stragglers like him but his old training officer's providential appearance gave him a surge of hope against hope. Alternately smiling in happiness and grimacing in pain, he begged the captain to take him with him. Kojo's composure had already been shaken. Perhaps the tears he felt beginning to form were for himself and his hopeless position as much as for the doomed amputee. It took all his willpower to keep himself from breaking down. I'd like to help you, but I can't he said, regaining his self-control. You know I'm responsible for my troops and I must catch up to them. But don't give up. There's no reason for pessimism just because things look difficult at the moment. Get back to your unit, even if you have to creep. Dragging himself to a nearby hill, the captain used his sword to cut a makeshift crutch from a stand of bamboo. He would fight tears again much later when he learned the supplicant was miraculously among the 32nd Army's 10% of survivors. Kojo left the following night for Makabe, again supported by soldiers. When he arrived at the 22nd Regiment's new headquarters, he found the full regiment beefed up to about 300 troops, most of whom resembled those he'd seen leaving the hospital. Gravely wounded men who preferred dragging themselves back to their units to suicide. Many had arrived without weapons, and the regiment had none to distribute. The unit's sole remaining purpose was to delay the inevitable as long as possible. The mess was catastrophic to morale, for as the Americans had shown in fighting on despite heavy casualties at Sugarloaf, and the Japanese had demonstrated even more eloquently at the Shuri line. Its single most important ingredient, more so even than belief in eventual victory, is the commitment to comrades that overrides commitment to oneself. But the disappearance of almost all the old comrades had taken loyalty and cohesiveness with them. Although nearly all remaining units were being squeezed into the island's southern tip, organisation and communications were so feeble that Kojo knew even less than before about the fate of the 32nd Army as a whole, except that it was disintegrating. Actually, his 24th Division, with some 8,000 shaky men strung out on the west coast, was in far better shape than the once-proud 62nd, which was down to about 3,000 troops. A few units on southern mountains were fighting almost as at Shuri, but less as an integrated army than as additional testimony to the last reward of dying honourably. Kojo's knowledge that he could do nothing to make his own band into a fighting unit deepened his demoralisation.
It was almost a relief when Colonel Yoshida ordered him to take twenty men, together with his new adjutant and one more officer, and defend a small ridge about half a mile away at Maesato village. The new position was a few hundred yards from the western East China Sea coast, and just over a mile south of Itoman, Okinawa's fourth largest city, now in debris. This will be our final stand, he told his men. We'll die here. Then he deployed them. The twenty men had half a dozen rifles and many grenades, as well as some knee mortars and light machine guns, but they were stymied by the composition of their naked rise. Americans had found it impossible to dig foxholes in coral, even with tools. The Japanese phantoms with none couldn't scratch the surface. When the American advance reached them on June 20th, they could only lie on the ground during the mortar barrage, Kojo protected by the only bush in sight. The violation of the first rule of infantry warfare, take cover, disturbed him more than anything before. Nor could he communicate with his men during the day without risking instant death. When he checked the first night, fifteen were alive. The next day, some surviving signal troops brought him a radio message from. Colonel Yoshida, still in a cave on a hill less than a thousand yards away. We're being attacked. If possible, return your battalion here. Kojo answered that he'd try as soon as it was dark. He could see enemy guns, tanks and flamethrowers attacking the general location of his regimental headquarters. That was the end of the 22nd Regiment. Yoshida's last message was the traditional one, promising to fight to the end and wishing Kojo luck. General Buckner believed the Japanese evacuation of Shuri, no matter how lucky and skilful, had come too late to confront his 10th Army with more than isolated moments of stiff fighting farther south. Roughly four-fifths of Ushijima's machine guns and nine-tenths of his artillery pieces were destroyed or inoperable. One way or another, a quarter of his remaining troops, 10,000 to 15,000 men, had been lost during the withdrawal. Roughly a fifth of the combat forces in place on L Day were in fighting condition, a category that included many with serious wounds as well as the universally exhausted healthy. Real strength was less than that of a proper division, against the four and a half vastly stronger American ones chasing him. It's all over now, but cleaning up pockets of resistance, Buckner assured correspondents on May 31st. But the big gun advocate and his well-supplied staff greatly underestimated the misery waiting in the last eight square miles still in Japanese hands. Although no more Shuri lines lay ahead, the third of the south's three east-west mountain spines rose six miles farther south. Japanese were retreating to almost anywhere they could find, but principally to strong points that had been well prepared by units of the 24th Division and the crack 9th before it was sent away. Every night still belonged to the enemy. More desperate now, the Japanese took greater risks and made many Americans even more trigger-happy. A desperado slithered into the foxhole of Dan Maxco, a 4th Marines machine gunner, at about 3 a.m. on June 12th. Matsko grabbed his arms as he tried to pull the pin of a grenade, then fought the grenade away. Next, he struggled to wrest away a big club, with which he beat the Japanese before stabbing him with his own kabar knife. In the words of a chronicler of his platoon, he finally threw the nip out of the hole and shot the bastardly nip. Several nights earlier, Stuart Upchurch had heard an unseen intruder slip in near his foxhole. A sharp-eyed platoon mate finally saw him and threw a grenade. Upchurch heard groans, then the blast of a second grenade, not American, he could tell, and felt bits of flesh blown all over him. The infiltrator had held the second grenade, his own, to his chest. Near midnight, another Japanese penetrated even closer than the first until caught by a ten-gauge shotgun from about four feet away. Marines loved shotguns and filched all they could from supply depots. The blast tore off some of the second infiltrator's face, severed a hand and blew apart his chest. Still later that night, a third Japanese ran back and forth just outside the platoon's line until he was killed by a cascade of grenades. Japanese persistence puzzled and frightened the platoon, 
They'd come to our lines, we'd kill them, and that was that. Still, many Americans felt an even greater threat just because the sorely pressed enemy appeared more reckless in the dreaded dark. At every rise you never knew, said a Marine whose company took more casualties after than before the Shuri line, although that was rare. Every night you never knew. Every break was still greeted with relief before the advance resumed. During the first fortnight in June, Army divisions pushed south on the east coast and Marines on the west toward the last mountain spine in Japanese hands. A participant in that fighting on more level, open ground, described it as being in a one-acre park with someone you had to find behind some bush and kill before he killed you. Makeshift Japanese positions occasionally pinned down units until they were extricated by smoke screens or tanks. An American squad encountered a large rice paddy and knew they'd be pigeons when they had to cross it. They ran in single file, ten yards apart, and as fast as they could through the watery knee-deep mud. Sure enough, snipers picked some of them off. Still, far less effective use of terrain by the Japanese than at the Shuri line made the going now through the scrubby land much easier. The strain of the daytime fighting was also reduced by the sharp drop in incoming artillery and mortar fire, and many fewer machine gun emplacements, and the weather improved. In June, the mud dried to make inordinate dust. A single car on pre-war Okinawa's dirt roads raised a thick cloud of ochre particles. Now each truck, tank and self-propelled gun in the fleets of them temporarily blinded you until the slight breeze could clear the air, an army officer noted. The dust also choked people so regularly near the main roads that one of the principal expert recommendations about equipment after the campaign would be for goggles and dust respirators to be issued to all personnel. But dust was easier to take than mud as long as there was a steady supply of drinking water, with less danger creeping, crawling and tiptoeing to Japanese-occupied caves, the Americans could devote relatively more attention to flushing them out. Although some units liked to skirt as many caves as possible, more tried to miss none in their path, since many surely housed the coming night's infiltrators. Dick Whitaker's second wounding, which earned him an examination on a hospital ship and a night on an actual cot in his regimental hospital, took place in early June. Feeling better for his rest and hot meal, he returned to his company and found his machine gun squad reorganised in his absence because it had been reduced to shreds on Sugarloaf. He was made a runner for his company commander, replacing a previous one who'd been shot through the head while standing beside that officer. But when the company was advancing in early June and he had no messages to deliver at a given time, he advanced with the others. Now, to drive the occupants from where they could deliver return fire, the attacking unit fired heavily into cave mouths and gun ports with the help of tanks when available, as they would be at Kojo's final position. Then they usually shouted, De te koi! De te koi! Come out! Come out! Loudly and repeatedly, often with bullhorns. A few linguists added, Shimpachina! We'll give you food and water. No answer in a reasonable time set the blowing party to work. Thousands of caves were neutralised by a method so practised that it would have been routine if not for everyone's knowledge that a second's lapse in concentration could be fatal. Members of a team kept the occupants from peeking out of the mouth by pouring heavy rifle and bar fire into it, while others mounted the cave and looked for cracks, crevices or an air hole, ventilating shafts in more elaborate installations on top. From there, one of a variety of explosives was dropped inside, or several in combination. When explosions sounded inside caves before any payloads were dropped, the suicides they signified were welcomed. In that case, valiant or foolhardy American volunteers sometimes entered the darkness after an appropriate interval of silence from within. At a more or less typical opening in a limestone hill, an interpreter repeatedly shouted the come out call from 50 feet away. A woman in faded pantaloons and a ripped blouse eventually appeared at the mouth with a naked baby on her back and a child of about five at her side. 
Repeated assurances she wouldn't be harmed drew the woman a few steps into the open until angry shouts from inside pulled her back there. Three blasts soon shook the hill, and the woman, now headless, was among ten shattered bodies the Marines found in the cave's wreckage. The others included the two children, their arms almost severed, and another baby. Pieces of infant and parental flesh adhered to the walls, a common sight. Many American teams entered caves to see families clustered together, their torsos ripped apart or brains blown out by a grenade exploded by a parent who was still clutching the children. But suicide explosions were not relied on for a full flushing because they often killed only a portion of the people inside. The attackers had to do most of the work themselves. Experienced cave blowers tried to save their dynamite satchel charges for the largest targets. A demolitions specialist would crawl to a ventilation hole, or sometimes the mouth, with the charge, light it, and wait six or seven seconds to prevent the occupants from tossing it back out, which often happened to inexperienced teams. Then the specialist would run. In other cases, fragmentation and white phosphorus grenades were used. Or gasoline or flamethrower napalm was brought up in drums, poured into the upper openings, and ignited with a phosphorus grenade. Since unaccompanied grenades were rarely effective except in the smallest caves, some Americans used homemade bombs of C2, an explosive putty packed in a can with a grenade for a detonator. General Buckner called all that the blowtorch and corkscrew method, something highly inflammable being the blowtorch and explosives the corkscrew. Americans liked the white phosphorus grenade for its smoke, partial cover for when they decided to storm caves, the most dangerous method of all. The chemical stuck to the skin and could not be removed by water or any solution available to the 32nd Army, let alone civilians. Vaseline worked, but the Okinawans didn't have any, or anything else, an American corpsman noted. Some likened the light of the blue flame with which it burned to that of massed fireflies. While family members or fellow soldiers vainly scraped at the eerie luminescence, it melted holes in the flesh, often down to the bones. By the time most victims lost consciousness, the mud around them also glowed. Other times, American grenades set off munitions stored inside. Although supplies of Japanese shells were scanty in the south, their petric acid sent up an acrid yellow smoke that was more lethal than anything dropped, thrown or fired inside. It took more lives than the explosions and flames. Similarly, Flamethrowers caused many more deaths by suffocation than by burns, the flames consuming all the oxygen in many of the smaller caves. The weapon that most terrified Japanese soldiers was the new long-range flamethrower mounted on Sherman tanks and adapted to shoot a mixture of gasoline and napalm. Although not the final answer to cave cleaning that the 10th Army planners had hoped for, those tanks, with flexible hosing for use on inaccessible terrain, greatly helped. Otherwise, ordinary man-mounted flamethrowers were used, and it was a measure of the universality of fear that the men who operated those symbols of World War II inhumanity themselves trembled each time they waddled toward the mouth of a cave. With 95 hugely awkward pounds of equipment and volatile liquid strapped to their backs, the volunteers for that hazardous work couldn't carry a rifle or a carbine. Terrifying in itself. They had to take extreme care not to trip and fall, in which case they couldn't get up without help and might easily themselves be incinerated by a bullet hitting their tanks. Unable to crouch or quickly hit the ground, silhouetted against the sky from inside the caves, they were vulnerable targets deprived of the infantryman's first protection of taking cover. You couldn't see them in there, but they could see you, a perfect bullseye without a rifle, Evan Regal would recall still a little wide-eyed at the memory. No matter how short of ammunition they might be in there, all it would take was just one round. My heart pounded when I went out, every time. It could take a combat eternity of fifteen heart-stopping minutes to approach a cave and find the necessary stable footing, another factor that made flamethrowers' casualties much higher than among ordinary infantrymen. Knowing their vulnerability and value, the riflemen with whom they worked tried to give them as much cover as possible, but it was always too little. 
of sixteen flamethrowers on Charlie Hill, the small strong point just north of Sugarloaf, Evan Regal and three others survived. Fearless on the outside, the tough farm boy quaked within. The uninvolved tend to recoil from cave flushing as unfair slaughter of the trapped. Those who had to do it were all caught up in the heavy work and deadly risks. This is all a bloody business, a marine wrote home about those weeks. But I'm here and digging my foxholes just a foot deeper than the next guy. I've said enough prayers to write a full-size book and thanked God twice as many times for surviving so far. After the explosions, the attackers readied to resume firing on the mouth unless the blasts had sealed it. Nerves remained strained even after all manner of scorching and riddling with bullets, since no volume of fire or explosive could reach all recesses of the larger caves, each man in sight of an entrance remained a potential target. When occupants began emerging, natives were often first, sometimes shoved from behind. Almost all Americans tried not to shoot them. A large percentage inevitably failed because they'd learned to fire at the slightest hint of unusual movement from anyone but children and the elderly. Killing civilians was a devastating experience for most, especially when they hadn't known who was inside the blown caves. But although dismembered corpses of women and children deeply shocked teams that peeked inside, they were among the war's costs, like those gunned down as they emerged. Before the blasts, Americans couldn't differentiate between caves sheltering natives and Japanese, or a mixture. After them, they were hard-pressed to distinguish among the people stumbling out. A Pio's marina found it, pretty hard at first, to accept that our people were shooting human beings who weren't necessarily military. But after I saw what their people, including civilians, did with their hands up, I worried about us, not them. I wanted to leave Okinawa alive. While most of the hands-up tricks were performed by soldiers rather than civilians, some of the former were now wearing the latter's clothes. A portion of them feigned surrender just long enough for a thrust into a loincloth for a final grenade. Small as their number was, it was large enough to implant the lesson into the jittery Americans. A Jap makes a move to give himself up, but lifts his arms at the last minute and out tumble two hand grenades, Evan Regal would remember. That wasn't talk, I saw it. You couldn't trust a single one of them. That was why all civilians between the ages of roughly ten and sixty were regarded as potential booby traps, and why the prime rule was not to take your eye off the devious gooks for a second until they could be searched. If they had anything less than a terrified look on them, fingers tightened on triggers, another veteran would remember. We were pretty terrified ourselves, and some of us were pretty eager to fire away. If you didn't feel so goddamn threatened yourself, you might have had tremendous pity for the human wreckage in those underground dungeons, a fellow added. The specimens who came out were horrific. Starving Okinawan boys in Japanese uniforms, younger kids in just pitiful shape, and lots of mutilations of all ages. Inside, the caves were simply terrible, I can't describe it. People burned to a crisp, giving off that ghastly smell. But you couldn't have real pity because you yourself were so wound up and concentrating on the danger facing you. So if those civilians didn't have that fear on their faces, they were dead. During the night of June 11th, a long line of civilians wrapped in dirty blankets headed toward an American unit from farther south. They had nearly passed the forward positions when a vigilant sergeant sensed something wrong. He and his men raked the line with machine gun fire, then found that many of the group were Japanese soldiers with grenades and demolition charges under their blankets. A few days later, Anthony Cortese helped throw a heavy charge into a large cave from which no one had emerged in answer to the usual detecoy calls. He might have held back had he known there were many women and children inside, but that wouldn't have solved his problem. We had to assume Japs were in there too, and what about them? Besides, I'd already done a cave where civilians came out first, then a Jap soldier with his hands up. Suddenly he throws himself on the ground and the man behind him, dressed as a woman, starts firing from a Nambu strapped to the first guy's back. 
We all started firing the minute he hit the ground and killed over a dozen civilians together with the two Japs. But what could you do? What you couldn't do was take a chance. A barrel-chested Japanese with his hands held high aroused the suspicion of a lieutenant from Captain Owen Stebbins's G-222 company. The lieutenant didn't know precisely why he shot him dead with his carbine from 15 yards, but as he fired, he alerted his men with a great shout of, Fire in the hole! which saved their lives by sending them instantly prone. His bullet caused a large explosion. Barrel Chest had wired himself to blow apart as many Americans as possible together with himself. Much later, a handful of Japanese would express regret for such subterfuge in accounts heavy with sorrow, chiefly for themselves. Kenjiro Matsuki, the first baseman for Japan's first professional baseball team, watched fellow soldiers make a white flag in order to inch within grenade-tossing range of Americans. The veteran sportsman would feel ashamed to relate such things, yet what else could we do at that point? Perhaps that was a new expression of Japan's old tendency to believe her oppression by foreigners justified any subterfuge. Dick Whitaker approached caves with typical anxiety. You'd see a stick peeking out with a white rag tied to it. But what was on the other end? Civilians? Japs trying to draw your fire so they could get in a last shot back? Let's say a woman comes out, then a woman with a baby, then a couple of kids, and then a man. Who the hell is he? If he's a soldier, is he armed? Years later, we learned the Japanese army had a percentage of Okinawan Home Guard conscripts who took their families with them when they retreated. But we had no clear idea then of the relationship between civilians and soldiers. Infantrymen find some little security in predictability, but it further decreased when units combed fields patched with scrub. The day after Whitaker was made a runner, his new unit was held up atop a slight rise in an area that had been subjected to some preliminary clearing. Privates were rarely told the reason for such delays, this one even happier than most because a welcome sun was shining after the weeks of deluge and mud. It would quickly grow stronger, replacing the hardship of perpetual wet and cold with tropical heat and giving Whitaker one of his indelible memories of June. Japanese bodies so bloated by gas that their skin was about to burst, much like, he thought, a boiled knockwurst. But no Japanese, dead or alive, was in sight at the moment, and a member of the party named Nick Trademis walked down from the little rise to relieve himself. Living together like a wolf litter and plagued by dysentery, the others took no particular notice of the squatter in his open area until a friend of Whitaker's named Jenny Lewis detected a movement some 25 yards away. It was a Japanese soldier sneaking up on him with a bayonet tied to a bamboo pole. Lewis dropped to a prone position and whispered, Watch this! When his rifle was steady, he shouted, Hey Nick, what's that? and pointed to the approaching Japanese. The sight of the bayonet caused Nick to cut short his business, pull up his pants, and grab his rifle in a single movement. When Lewis shot the intruder a second later, the others howled with the gusto of comic relief. A similar incident two months earlier might have ended tragically for the group. If Lewis had shouted before setting up for a sure shot, the attacker might have thrown a grenade at Nick. If one of the others had charged down the rise before Lewis fired and the soldier with the bayonet was the point man for a patrol behind him, or bait for an ambush, the charger might have been shot. But before opening the curtain on his little number, Lewis knew exactly what was needed to be certain of a kill, while the others instinctively made no move except to take aim too and survey every bush in sight before they laughed. What bothered American infantrymen now was that their dearly acquired combat wisdom didn't help during the new, fast-moving advance. The formerly underground enemy was now popping up from seemingly nowhere, requiring unpractised split-second responses. Some appeared from what Marines called spider holes, because, as one would explain, you couldn't believe a human being could fit into such a tiny space. Spider holes seemed to be everywhere. Their openings, covered with leaves or branches, were often undetectable until a Japanese fired and disappeared again. 
The enemy soldier after enemy soldier Whitaker's company, shot in June, did not win its members much sense of security. You're crossing a field of grass up to your waist, advancing in a good line, when somebody suddenly stands up thirty yards away. Is he armed? Is he bait? Does he have a Nambu strapped to his back? Then another pair of hands goes up and another. And it's scary. It happens very fast, and you better react even faster. A lot of our earlier lessons about the fortifications went out the window, because now you never knew what they'd do. Surrender, blow themselves up, blow you up. Some seemed to switch from one goal to another in a fraction of a second. On watch at his machine gun as dawn approached on June 11th, Melvin Hecht saw a gang of Japanese charge over the sandy ridge where his squad was dug in. Their shouts curdled blood. Banzai! Marine! You die! Hecht readied to mow them all down, but the machine gunner's dream turned to nightmare when sand jammed the gun, and his rifle too. One screaming charger dived straight for him. He was certain his time had come until other squad members opened up and killed some twenty Japanese as close as five yards from the position. Hecht discovered the man who dived at him had no rounds in his chamber, just a bayonet. If he'd had a single bullet, I wouldn't be writing this, his memoir, today. Fresh excrement in the scrub put Whitaker's senses under huge strain until he shot its maker or moved out of rifle range. One of his patrols brought him to a Japanese field hospital as hurriedly makeshift as the one where Tadashi Kojo rested during his withdrawal from Shuri. A pathetically emaciated patient lay prostrate on a bunk, waiting for an American corpsman's examination. The picture of defeat seemed too weak to move, until he pulled a grenade from his loincloth, jerked out its pin, and hit it on his fist to detonate it. A member of Whitaker's team shot him before he could throw it, corroborating yet again the detestable dictum that the only good Jap was a dead one. They had never fought in ordinary ways. Now, googed from their fortifications, they could be counted on only to do something crazy. The 32nd Army's crazy behaviour now was caused by its squeeze between the obligations of the national military ethic and the extremely unequal battle conditions. Over 60,000 men had been killed in May, in ways much like those that wore down Tadashi Kojo's battalion, whose reduction to the dozen survivors mirrored the losses of most others defending the Shuri line. The ability of some Wehrmacht units defending Normandy the previous summer to hold out and even counterattack despite appalling casualties deeply impressed Allied commanders. But many German weapons, unlike the Japanese, were better than the corresponding Allied ones, and the panzer divisions that fought with extraordinary skill and tenacity despite their dismal prospects did not nearly match the Japanese feat of endurance now, when most troops were living with their own excrement, drinking muddy water from bomb craters, dying of gangrene. Perhaps only a Japanese army could have sustained some 75% casualties, 72,000 in number, in two months of fighting without mutinying. The wonder wasn't that organisation and discipline were deteriorating in early June, but that they'd remained intact so long. But the something essential that changed with Ushijima's decision to withdraw from the Shuri line shook even units less shattered than Kojo's. Captain Koichi Ito, whose battalion had made the only successful advance in the ill-fated May 4th counter-offensive, was among the regular field officers determined to continue inspiring his men with a display of the old composure and confidence. Pride in being Japanese and self-respect as an army officer kept the persona of Kojo's haughty academy classmate intact. When we lost comrades, we were certain we would follow them sooner or later. Of course we held our lives dear, but our deepest wish was not to be captured. The wounded were sometimes killed to prevent that when we withdrew. Some were weak, some dishonourable, as in any human group. But I was determined to give all I had for the sake of Japan and the Imperial Army. The importance the Japanese attached to their leaders helped keep a relatively high percentage of battalion commanders alive, but many, like Kojo, were too physically and mentally exhausted to radiate the prescribed confidence.
and without similar shielding, a great proportion of subordinate officers, including the lieutenants and junior captains serving as company commanders, weren't alive. That was extremely detrimental to morale, because a leaderless Japanese unit wasn't considered a unit at all. Thus, the 32nd Army's great losses and last-minute reorganisations had a kind of multiplier effect on the plummeting spirits. Many men were beyond being inspired in any case. No people were more moved by symbols than the Japanese. In this case, the pluck, resolve, strength and ability to prevail over richer Westerners that was symbolised by holding on to the Shuri line, which was also some compensation for their enormous losses. The shock and pain of evacuating it stripped many of their moral stamina just as exit from the last of the major fortifications stripped them of their best, as they saw it their only protection. Psychological study would later establish that the critical cause of combat stress is duration, even more than severity. All men, including the best and bravest, eventually break under relentless emotional and physical strain. A solid month of unrelieved combat produced some degree of battle fatigue in nearly 100% of American troops. Those who fought on Okinawa needed no research for that, knowing the importance of their withdrawals from the line for rest. It was a shining credit to regular officers like Kojo and to Japanese society in general that so few of the defenders cracked, although they had none. Or it was a condemnation of that society, since far more would have lived if officers and senior soldiers hadn't been blindly loyal. In any case, their resolve began snapping now. The rarity of friendly artillery's dulcet roar was another dark sign, as well as a tactical deprivation. A few of the 10% of Japanese big guns not destroyed or abandoned were broken down into pieces for transport farther south, where they would not fire again. An infantry unit on the dismal evacuation trek came upon a single heavy gun still intact. Its crew was struggling to tug it, inches at a time, through the deep mud of a devastated road in a driving rain, a sight that, again, symbolised to viewers the impoverishment of their inner resources too. The proud Yamato men who had sacrificed so much found the current situation almost incomprehensible, Without necessarily believing the brave would live and the cowardly die, they had expected to see some evidence that the side of the brave and virtuous would be rewarded. The decimation of the 12th Independent Infantry Battalion had begun on L Day near the landing beaches. The bombing and shelling, whose purpose seemed to be to destroy not only humans but also the last ant, dismayed Private Kanjiro Matsuki. After ten days, 350 of the battalion's proud 1,500 men remained. They retreated, one unit eventually to a vital strong point at Maeda, two miles north of Shuri and a mile west of Kochi. Not long before the last of Kojo's force there was overrun, that unit withdrew, eventually to a shelter from which a group of soldiers made a night attack. Private Matsuki watched them leave under cover of darkness to assault an enemy-held escarpment. After the booming order of attack, he heard machine gun fire from the American position, then a howling of whoo and oh we, a tragically heroic sound that lasted for several minutes while the enemy machine guns continued firing. Most dying soldiers Matsuki had previously seen called for their mothers, rather than making the glorious shouts of army hype but now he actually heard a chorus of the celebrated Emperor Banzai. That night, for the very first and perhaps the last time, I heard the brave words, seemingly jerked out by some great force. He would later learn that 60 of the assault's 90 men were killed. Then the former first baseman, an independent spirit by Japanese standards, retreated farther with three others, moving at night, hard pushed by the American advance that would resume in the morning, ready to use their hand grenades for suicide. A blazing machine gun stopped them on their way, and they hid in a rain-filled bomb crater until the flares lost some of their power near dawn, and the heavenly gift of a morning mist offered a hint of protection. Matsuki led the way in another dash of some 300 yards to a possibly more permanent hiding place. The machine gun didn't fire again, 
We'd stayed in the crater so long that maybe the enemy got tired of waiting or thought we died there. If Kojo had to fight tears when confronted by his former trainee with the fresh amputation, such sights understandably shook the non-professional soldiers even more. The forced abandonment of masses of wounded during the retreat dealt another great blow to morale. It struck hardest at veterans of victorious campaigns in China and elsewhere, where they used to dash to injured buddies and carry them back for treatment. But even newcomers to combat were mortified by failing the wounded now. When a flare suddenly ignited directly over four litter bearers carrying a man they didn't know, they dropped their burden and ran. We didn't feel sorry for the stranger. We didn't think about helping him. We only thought about saving our own lives. A warrant officer lamented that an animal instinct of survival prevailed. When an older recruit had grieved over his first witnessed death in April, a lieutenant objected. Hundreds, no, thousands of you will be blown off the face of the earth, he snapped. Be resigned to that fate. Still, friends had been able to offer some sort of care during April and May. Now good men were pained and shamed by being reduced to deserting the injured. Almost all serious wounds made brave men frightened ones, a transformation hastened by the state of the medical care. Although most of the great numbers of wounded left behind did not live to spread their gloom, those determined to join the withdrawal made up for them, and were as likely to receive indifference or coldness as compassion from soldiers of other units. An actor named Masao Murata had been performing with a respected theatre in Japan when he was drafted a second time, after a four-year shift in Manchuria. On Sugarloaf, a grenade gashed the staunch Patriot's back and right hip on May 16th, the day before Dick Whittaker was hit in the hand. When Murata's unit was ordered to retreat, he was abandoned, in his own word, with two dried biscuits. His departing comrades gave assurances they would return to fetch him, but he knew their retreat would make that impossible. Once infected, his wounds became grotesquely swollen. Of course no one returned. The struggle for survival was beginning to extinguish all sense of unity and common purpose. A colonel on the other side of Shuri from Sugarloaf made a selection for Kirikomi, suicidal hand-to-hand -hand combat, at that same time. His picked unit used to shout Banzai going into battle, but now a chatter of teeth echoed in its cave. Most of the twenty men the colonel selected were seriously wounded, therefore chilled with fear, like Murata, who'd thought more about what he owed the emperor than about his own welfare until his injuries punctured his courage, allowing the most terrifying fear of being left behind to penetrate. While Whittaker's first wound was being treated at the battalion aid station north of Sugarloaf, Murata crawled down from his hill and wandered alone for three full days.